Thank you to our worship team this morning. I am. Some of you uh, remember Karina, who led our worship this morning. She uh, was here a month ago, and she, when we were at our last Sunday at Da Vinci, and she brought a message. Her story is um, is so powerful. Um, and uh, if you didn't have a chance to listen to that, go on our, our website and go to, I think it's March 10th, and you can watch that, that message. Very powerful. And so great to have you and your family here this morning, Karina and, and Sebastian, and uh, excited about what God is up to in you guys' lives. So, hey, I want to have you open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. And um, I'm going to do a Bible plug real quick, and then I'm going to pray. The greatest asset you have in your life is this. It's, it's the, the, the directional manual, the how-do manual, the manual to live a fulfilled life, and it gives you everything that you possibly could need. The Bible calls it, or I said the Word calls it in, in Ephesians 6, it's called the sword of the Spirit. It's a part of the weapons that the enemy that we do battle against the enemy with and that God has given us, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the feet shod with readiness, and the sword of the Spirit. It's the one thing that we have to speak to any situation that we have. And so my encouragement to all of you is going to take you way out of your comfort zone. Are you ready for this? If you don't have a Bible, a Bible. I'm a little bit old school. I know you can get the Bible on apps. I, I get it. It's, I'm okay with that. I have no problem with that. But there is something about every day opening up a book that has the Word of God in it and that you can feed upon it and it'll give you everything that you possibly need. The other thing that I like about it is as you meditate on it, you're going to have moments where you can underline something or drop a note in a margin. And I know for me that there are times when I need a word and all of a sudden I get a picture of where that verse is. Even though I don't know the exact address, I'm like, I know that's in Timothy. I know that's there. And I'll see it and I'll open up my Bible and I'll go, and I'll, yep, there it is. I underlined it. That's, that's, that's where I go. So get a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we got Bibles in the pews right in front of you. And if you don't have a Bible and you need a Bible, you are more than welcome to take one of those Bibles with you today. Just take it with you. Nobody's going to say you're stealing. We're giving this to you as a gift. Can you imagine? What are you in for? I got caught stealing a Bible. <laughs> yep. They gave, me, they gave me 20 to life. I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. At least I got something to read now, right? Oh, God is good. I want you to pray with me. Father, this morning... Uh, my prayers for Israel. Um, I, don't, I don't think most people in the world realize the significance of what is taking place over in the Middle East. And Lord, this attack upon Israel is significant in every way, Lord God. And Lord, your word tells us, Lord, that we're to pray for Israel. In fact, Lord, in Zechariah 2, it says, whoever is Israel touches the apple of his eye. And so, Lord, we know that uh, Israel represents the people of God, your, your people. And, Lord, that as, as those that are not Jewish, Lord God, we've been grafted in by your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we lift up that country. We lift up the city of Jerusalem, Lord God. We pray that you would protect the people. I pray that the enemy would be withheld back, pushed back, Lord God. I pray for wisdom for uh, the United States of America and what they're doing. I pray for wisdom over Israel and all the allied forces, Lord God, that you would give them God's wisdom in this situation, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. amen. I would imagine that most of us uh, in our lives at one time or another have uh, felt this thought about God and we're saying, God, where are you? <laughs> you're, you're in the midst of a difficult situation, a trial or whatever, and, and you might find yourself saying, you know, I believe in God, but 
I just don't experience him. I don't know where he is. And, and it may be that you're going through a situation right now and you're just wondering if the Lord cares about your pain. Does he, does he care about what's going on in your life, the struggles, the heartbreaks? And if he didn't care, it seems like he would do something about it, right? Like, do you care? Do, do, do you really understand what's happening in me and through me right now? And I think some of us sometimes, we're just trying to find peace in the midst of the panic. Some of you have experienced panic attacks, especially in the middle of the night. You wake up and all of a sudden there's a fear that comes over you and, and, and it, just, it just comes in, you know, so quickly. And your heart rate escalates and in some cases you oftentimes feel like you're actually having a heart attack when you're in the midst of a, a panic attack and you can't even really understand why you're having it. You're just overcome with a situation, fear rises in, you feel like you can't overcome. And maybe you feel like that God's not there in the midst of your, your panic. And the question, does he notice? Does he care? Does he understand? And I want you to know, probably all of us in this room at one time or another have felt that. You're not alone. It's not like just something that you've gone through. I want to, today, as we've been looking at miracles of Jesus over the last few weeks, today I, I want to look at this idea, Lord, where are you? I need a miracle. We're going to look at Mark chapter 4 this morning and picking up at verse 35. Disciples uh, in this moment find themselves in an unexpected storm. They're on a boat with Jesus. Most of us have heard this story. And, and as they're in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, a storm comes up and a lot of fear kicks in. And uh, they feel like they're in the midst of something that they can't change, they can't they can't handle, uh, something that they didn't choose, they didn't want, they didn't expect. Someone once said that you're either getting ready to head into a storm or you're in the middle of a storm or you're just coming out of a storm. And I don't know, when I look at that, I kind of feel like, well, that doesn't sound very comforting, does it? You know, that I'm either getting ready to head into one, I'm getting ready, to, I'm in the middle of one, or I'm, I'm coming out of one, but either way you look at it, that you're in a storm. So look at the passage with me, picking up at verse 35. It says, that day when Eve came to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. phrase. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, and the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? I thought that's interesting. They asked this question, don't you care if we drown? And what's interesting is, is that Jesus said to his disciples, let's get in the boat and let's go to the other side. The Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles long. It's about eight miles wide. Uh, Kathy and I took a trip to Israel a number of years ago, about 15 years ago or so, and we had the opportunity to get on a boat that probably would have been much like the boat that the disciples and Jesus were on, and we went from one side over to the other side. It was a beautiful sunny day. There was no big swells. It was not raining or windy. It was a rather wonderful time. I love being on the water. If I was able to, I would own a boat because I just like being on the water. This storm comes up, and it brings fear, and it brings helplessness, like I'm completely out of control. As Californians, we kind of feel that way when an earthquake hits. I mean, some of you were here for the Northridge earthquake, and I remember that earthquake was about 5.30 in the morning or so. Kathy and I were brand new parents. Our daughter was just months old, and I remember jumping out of bed. I remember running into her room and lifting her out of her crib and then Kathy and I standing in the doorway, uh, we had a two-story apartment, and we were looking down the stairs, and the whole building is swaying. You just feel the whole thing just 
just, just doing this. And we had the chandelier hanging in the stairway as, and, and it was swinging so much it was hitting wall to wall. And I remember just standing there holding on to little Jordan, looking at Kathy going, oh dear God, this is big. This is big. Oh dear God. And then I said this, Lord, please let this be the epicenter where we're at. Because I knew the building was still standing, we were alive, and we were just hunkering in there. And it seemed like, you know, three or four hours that that earthquake lasted, right? You know, it just seemed like it, would just, it just would not stop. But it, it probably lasted a good, close to 60 seconds, where you just felt the shaking, you felt the movement, those kinds of things. Do you remember what happened after that? For the next three, four, five days, there was aftershock after aftershock after aftershock, and it wouldn't go away. And I remember in the middle of the night, it's shaking one time, and I remember just saying out loud, oh, dear God, we're done with this. We're over with this. I realized that I wasn't in control, but there was nothing I could do about the shaking. I think that the disciples were feeling this. Jesus says, let's go to the other side. They had just got done doing all this ministry time. And for those of you that have ever been into like ministry moments where you're either on the receiving end, somebody's speaking into your life, or you're on the giving end, you're ministering to people. One of the things that comes out of that is tiredness. You become emotionally exhausted. I remember a few years ago when we were actually in this building and we had been growing and we had gotten to the place where we were doing three services on Sunday morning. And by the time I got to the third service, I would say something, then I would pause and I would go, did I already say that? And I was getting tired, and, and I remember I would go home after that, and I would sit on my couch, and within just moments, I would fall asleep. Not physically tired, but emotionally tired. This is what's going on with the disciples. This is what's happening with Jesus. Now, here's the thing about going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee for the Jews. Jews avoided pagan people. They didn't like hanging out with them. They thought that they were evil, uh, there were rumors that in the midst of that side of the, the lake, that side of the sea, that, that the devil himself actually lived there. And uh, it was known as a realm of death. And people were superstitious about the sea. One of the Bible commentators said this about the Sea of Galilee. The sea was known to swallow entire ships and gulp down people. The common superstition. To view the water as the abyss where demons lurked in the deep, this sea was considered the manifestation of the realm of death. And here's Jesus, after a long day of ministering with the disciples, says, come on guys, let's get in the boat. We're going over to the death side. We're going to go over and hang out with the pagans. We're going to go over and minister to them. Sure enough, that's what happens. How many know that when you give yourselves over to the Lord that the promise of God is that he's going to take care of you? I was reminded of this passage this morning in John 16, He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. I think that's a scripture that the disciples probably should have thought about when they were in the midst of the boat and what the Lord would do for them. And sure enough, they are out in the middle of the sea, the storm blows up, and Here's the thing that I think is important for all of us to know. Even though you can be a Christian, you're still going to have storms in your life. You're still going to have difficulties. See, the promise is that when you come to Jesus and you get saved, that life is going to be hunky-dory and easygoing. That's not the promise. Actually, Jesus said, before you pick up your cross and follow me, count the costs. I, I would say that living a life as a, as a Christian, living out your life as a Christian is hard. It's difficult. It's wonderful. But there are moments when I'm like, Lord, this is just too hard. I, I just can't do this anymore. I need you. I need you to come in the midst of my storm. Disciples in this moment of the storm, they felt desperate. They felt like they had lost control. And they felt like Maybe Jesus couldn't do anything for them. In fact, in verse 38, it says that if Jesus was at the stern, sleeping on a cushion, the disciples welcomed him and said, Teacher, don't you care? 
don't you care if we drown? You ever say that to somebody? Something bad's going on, something difficult's going on. It may be, you know, in your own family. And you get this, hey, don't you care? Don't you care what's going on? Don't you, don't you care what the things that are happening? I remember getting in a pretty difficult conversation at the beginning of COVID, and, and uh, there were so many wonderful things to talk about at the beginning of COVID, wasn't there? there? There was race relations, there was the pandemic, there was politics. Those were all just wonderful, wonderful things. And, and I got in a very difficult situation in a conversation with a family member, and it got heated. And uh, I finally just kind of said, you know what, I'm going to push pause here. And then I said this. I read the book, and I've already jumped ahead, and I've read to the end of the story, and, and I just want you to know, we win. I, I know what the outcome is going to be. And there was an assuredness in my spirit, even though everything around us seemed to be chaos. And, and I want to tell you that maybe one of the most difficult seasons ever for pastors was the season of COVID and racism and politics. Churches closing, churches not being able to operate, people leaving churches, people attacking pastors. I mean, it was everything you could possibly imagine. And yet God was there. And here the disciples are, Lord, don't you care? Because if you did care, you would do something. We say that today. Lord, if you cared, you would provide that new job for me because I lost my job and I haven't found a job yet. And, and Lord, if you really cared, you'd, you would do that. Lord, if you really cared about my marriage, my marriage has been in a difficult situation for months, maybe even years, and we can't seem to get on the same page and we're not heading in the right direction and it looks like divorce, but Lord, if you cared, you would do something about my marriage. Lord, you know the trouble that my kid is having right now. He's struggling in every way and he's making bad choices and, and Lord, I've done everything I know to do, but if you cared, Lord, if you just would do something, Lord, because I'm in a situation right now, Lord, I need a miracle. I need you to step in. I need you to intervene in the situation I'm in right now because, Lord, if you don't do something, things aren't going to play out well. Do you care? Are you there? Have you been there? I have. So you find yourself in the middle of a storm and you ask this question, Lord, where are you? I need a miracle. So two things I want to talk about briefly this morning. First is this. Two things to remember when you're in a storm. You're in a storm with his presence. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. And the storm is bumping that boat around, and I'm sure there were swells, there was wind, and, if, and it was raining, and if there was wind, that rain was coming like, like sheets and, and coming down. And evidently, Jesus was a heavy sleeper because he was just chilling and he was just sleeping. Uh, maybe some of you are like that. You know, you're just, you can sleep through anything. Uh, our oldest son, Seth, he will sleep through anything. And he can sleep anywhere at any time. It doesn't matter if it's concrete, an airplane, or if he's hanging upside down in a tree. He'll, he'll just sleep. And, and that's where he's at. And, and it sounds like Jesus was this same kind of guy because he, he just could sleep in the midst of the storm. Here's the thing. Sometimes we get so caught up in what, the what of the storm, we forget the who in the boat. See, the who is more important than the what. Sometimes when we're in the midst of a storm, we're so focused on the storm itself that we forget the who that is with us as believers in Christ. Here's some scriptures I want you to look at because God's made some very powerful promises to us. This is why this is so important. Because when you face your storm, you need to know what God has to say about it when you're in the midst of your storm. And oftentimes, because we don't understand the word or we don't get into the word, we have no idea what we have there for us and therefore, we're not able to speak to the situation with any kind of authority because we don't know the authority that we have because we're not in God's word. Look at some of these passages. Deuteronomy 31.6. 
God will neither fail you nor abandon you. It's a promise from God. Joshua 1.5, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. Huh, we sing that kind of song that, this morning. He's with us. Joshua 1.9, do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Where, wherever you go, he is with you. He doesn't, he's not just with you when you come to church. Whatever dark alley you're walking down, whatever situation you're facing, whatever storm you're in, that the Lord is with you. He's never going to fail you. Psalm 23, 4, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, God has promised his presence over and over and over again. So don't get so caught up in what, of the what of the storm that you forget the who of the boat. Don't let the presence of the storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. And I think that's, that's the hard place because when we're in the storm, we have a tendency to start doubting. Scripture tells us in James 1 that when you are in a storm, you're facing trials, when you're facing tribulations, when you're going through a difficult season, the, 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 the promise is, and as James writes this, the brother of Jesus, he, he says, endure and persevere. In other words, he says, stay the course. Work through the storm because God's going to do something. Persevere Endure. It says, let perseverance have its perfect result lacking in nothing. And then it says something that I think oftentimes we miss. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask of the Father and he will give it to you generously. So if you're faced with a situation and you're not sure on how to deal with it, the decision you need to make, the Lord says, come to me, ask for wisdom, believe that you'll get it, and, and the Lord will give it to you. And then it gives us an admonishment. But when you ask, do not doubt. For when you doubt, you're like a wave upon the sea. Look at, think about the storm. You're like a wave upon a sea that is tossed to and fro. You're going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Uh, that would be called double-minded. And he doesn't want us to be double-minded. So if we lack wisdom, ask of the Father. He's going to give it to us generously. Don't doubt when you ask. Don't be like a wave on a sea that's tossed to and fro, back and forth, back and forth. But believe that you've received it. Believe that you have it. So don't let the presence of the storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. Sometimes when we're standing at a graveside, graveside for the loss of a family member or a friend, you need to know that you're not alone. He's with you. Someone breaks your heart, he's with you. You lose your job, God's with you. Phone call you never wanted to get, he's with you. Come home to an empty apartment, you're not alone, he's with you. And the way that comes about is through engaging in relationship and pursuing him. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Other translation says, press into him and he will press into you. Come to him, and he will come to you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. See, Jesus never said we wouldn't experience storms. He promised we would never be alone in the storms. And that's the key, that knowing when I face my storm that I'm not going to be alone, that he's right there. I, um, I couldn't help as I was working on this message this week to think of Karina, your story, and how you grew up, and you don't know just the the background of Karina was her mother was raped she was a drug addict um, mom had had the baby had Karina and she for the first years of her life I don't know what 47 times you moved something like that 47 times she moved between the age of 0 and 12 from drug addict to drug addict to abuse to all the things and at the age of 12 her mom abandoned her and she was a street girl for about five years. 
And somehow, some way, she got a Bible in her hands and opened it up to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dread amongst you. And for the next, those high school years, she, she did all the wrong things, all the yucky things. And yet somehow, God got a hold of her. And she had a supernatural move of the Spirit of God that came upon her. And just by reading that chapter, she came to know the Lord. And the Lord opened a door for a church, opened a door for discipleship, opened another door for an education, opened another door after another door after another door after another door. And she probably could get up here. And if if you were ever to talk about persevering in the midst of a storm and you wanted to look at the definition of that in in the dictionary, her picture would probably be next to it. And the thing that I love about Karina that, that grabbed my attention the first time I, I met her was her passion for Jesus. Her passion that, that not only her, her love for Jesus, but that she wants everybody to know the love of Jesus. I was talking with her yesterday, and she goes, she goes, why wouldn't we all just want everybody to love Jesus? I mean, let's start knocking on doors. Let's, we're we're, we're going to love Jesus. It's contagious when you get around people like that. You know, because I'm the guy that says, do we really have to knock on doors? I mean, can we, can we, can we, you know? See, these stories are important because all of us have been in a storm or will be in a storm or coming out of a storm and, and when we hear testimonies of others and what they did in their storm and how they navigated through their storm, how God met them in their storm, that they were never left alone, they were never forsaken, that God was there and came alongside them. When we hear those testimonies, then you say, you know what, I got hope. I can make it through my storm. I can stay the course. And when I get done making it through my storm, maybe my testimony is going to help the next guy and the next gal make it through their storm. My father, sitting on my apartment deck, lost everything he had, alcoholic, no money. Kathy and I had been married a couple of months, and he moved in with us. And I said these words to him as we were sitting out on the deck. I said, you may not see it right now, but God has a plan. And my encouragement to you is to stay the course and to fight the good fight because I know you know how to do that. And then I said this to him, let's switch seats. He goes, what? I go, let's switch seats. And so he got out of his chair, I got out of my chair, we switched seats, we sat down, and I said, this is a word from the Lord to you. Just as I am ministering to you through your son, there will be a day that things will change and you will begin to minister to others because of what you've been through. Do you know that a year later, my dad became the director of the Denver Rescue Mission where they fed 3,000 people a week, did on-job training, helped men and women get right and get back into society in a healthy way. See, sometimes you'll never experience the greatness of God until you go through the greatness of the storm. Until you go through that Oftentimes, you'll never experience the greater thing that God wants to do in your life. You're in a storm with his presence. Second thing to learn is when you are in a storm, you're in a storm for his purpose. There's a reason why you're going through the storm. Jesus is one who said, let's go to the other side. And the disciples weren't in the storm because they were out of his will. They were in his will. You know, they probably were saying, we should have never gotten in the boat. We should have never done this. It's just not working. We could die. In fact, we're probably going to die. And then maybe all of a sudden one of them just went, well, wait a minute. Jesus told us to get in the dang boat. Right? I mean, sometimes I have to look at things in the scripture and chuckle a little bit because you got to know he's the son of God. There's a reason, he says, let's get in the boat. There's a reason they're going to the other side. And I'm pretty stinking sure that he knew that there was going to be a storm. (laughs) And he had to be kind of a little bit inside going, oh, this is going to be so great. (laughs) (laughs) They they are going to be scared to death. And I'm just going to lay over there and sleep. 
I'm just going to chill. It's going to be okay. And they're going to be afraid, and they're not going to know what to do. And then God's going to move, and it's going to be awesome in every way because I'm going to be able to teach them something. I'm going to be able to show them something. So the question is, why did Jesus allow the disciples to endure the storm? And if I had to give you an honest answer, I would say, I don't know. I mean, I have some thoughts. But sometimes in Scripture, you don't get the exact answer. I, th- I think there's, there's a lot of white between the writing. Because I think that there's a place in there that you need to process and think about what the Lord is trying to say to you. I think that maybe something that they needed to learn, the disciples in the storm, is, is that they weren't going to be able to learn it from the safety of the shore. That if they weren't out in the boat in the midst of the storm, if they had just stayed on the shore, that they probably weren't going to be able to learn something that God wanted them to learn and to step into. That was my story. 20 years old, diving accident, broke my neck in two places, should have been killed, or certainly a quadriplegic. I didn't understand why it was happening. It was a significant storm. Uh, Things weren't good in my life at that time. I was in a relationship that I probably shouldn't have been in. Uh, I was working for my dad's swimming pool company that was in the process of going bankrupt. I found out after I had broken my neck that uh, there was no insurance. Um, We were working for free. We had no money. Uh, After I broke my neck, my brother moved into my apartment with me because I couldn't drive and I had to have the screws cleaned. So after church, when you're walking out and you notice these scars on my forehead, please don't stare. Okay? (laughs) Just. I know they're there. I see them every day. And that was my storm. And I praise God for my storm because it taught me so many things that I would have never learned taught me humility. It showed that I had, I had a serious issue with pride. It taught me patience because I wasn't a very patient man and I still struggle with patience, if I'm being honest. But the broken neck, the halo brace for four months, not being able to take a shower, not to be able to put a shirt on, not being able to put my head on a pillow, I mean, just on and on going out in public and everybody staring at you and you know, and, and uh, one of the greatest moments, I walked into a fast food restaurant and there was this little kid, probably four or five years old, with his mom, and he sees me in my halo brace. And when you're in a halo brace, you, you don't move, you move like this, you know, it's, you look like a monster, like Frankenstein. And he walks up and he grabs my, my jeans and he pulls on them and he goes, hey, mister, what happened to you? <laughs> and that poor mother, she was like trying to grab him and, and, and pull him away. But that was my storm. A lot of you in this room have been through serious storms, way worse than I've been through. You've lost a child. You've lost a spouse. I haven't experienced any of those things. Look what happens here with Jesus in verse 39. It says, Jesus got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still! And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. I picked up on the authority of that moment. He stood and with authority, he rebuked the wind and the rain, the storm. He he said, quiet! Incredible authority. You know, in Luke 10, 17, Disciples come back from an excursion of going out. The, the, the disciples, the greater number, and they've been going from town to town to town and, and uh, God was using them and they were casting out demons and healing the sick and raising the dead and all these great things were happening. And then they come back after a period of time and, and they, they get to where Jesus is and they're rejoicing and, and they said, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus' response was, hey, don't rejoice that the demons are subjected in your name, rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. See, what he was saying in that morning is don't get caught up 
on the authority that I've given you because he said, I have given you all authority over snakes and scorpions. In other words, he's given you the authority by the power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God that we can stand against the enemy, the skis of the enemy, and we can take authority. In other words, Jesus didn't sit up in the boat and go, God, could you just please just, just bring the wind down a little bit? He wasn't meek about it. He had an assurance about it. He wants you to have that kind of authoritative assurance. I can't help but think about this. You won't get this, but a lot of you will in the room. You remember the, the sitcom Happy Days? One of the funniest ones that I, I remember was Fonzarelli, right? Henry Winkler, you know, Arthur Fonzarelli. Uh, he's camping. And as he's laying there trying to sleep and is just laying there, and all you hear is all the animals chattering. Birds chirping, squirrels moving around, just loud as loud as loud. And all of a sudden, he just sits up and he does this. Cool it! <laughs> and all the animals stopped. <laughs> I think that's what it was like when Jesus rebuked the storm. <laughs> Come on, that was a great sermon illustration. <laughs> I, worked, I worked hard on that one. So here's what's cool about this story. Sometimes we think we have it all together, but until we go the storm, we don't realize we have it all together. Here's another thing that I pulled out of this text, is that Jesus is on a boat, and if there's anyone on the boat that's not a fisherman, it's Jesus. Peter was a professional fisherman. you got to know that Peter had been in storms before. You got to know that he's been out on the sea. He's experienced the rain and the wind and the high waves and all of those things. You got to know that that's taken place. And here's Peter, the professional fisherman, freaking out. Afraid. Doesn't know what to do. And I think one of the things that came out of this for Peter, something that he learned that later he wrote about. It's in 1 Peter 5, 7, where he said this, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Peter in the midst of the storm, anxiety overcoming him, fear overcoming him, and later on, Peter would write in his epistle that we can cast all of our anxiety because he cares for you. This word cast is only used one other time in the New Testament. And when you translate it, it means transfer. And, and what Peter is saying is that we are to take the weight of the anxiety and we're to transfer it to God. We're to give it to him. But here's, here's what happens, church. That oftentimes, without even realizing it, this comes from pride. We know what we're supposed to do, but we don't do it. We don't truly transfer it. We don't truly give it over to the Lord. And sometimes we, do, we, we give it over to him, but we don't really give it over to him. We have a tendency to hang on to it. I remember a message I did years ago when we were at the high school, and I, I, I remember the idea was I've got this thing that's it's weighing me down. It's not good, and I'm anxious and fearful, and here it is. And, and so I just said, Lord, here you go. And I just set it at the feet of Jesus. And when I did that, I just kept preaching. And I preached for another five minutes or so, and Every now and again while I was preaching, I would just kind of glance back at, you know, the thing over there. You know, and I'm doing my thing, and I'm preaching, and I'm preaching, and I'm glancing over there. And then finally in the middle of the message, I just said, well, God, if you're not going to take it, I'll just take it back. See, that's what we do. He says, cast the care, cast the concern, transfer the weight of what you're dealing with, and it's there that the Lord will take it from you. You no longer have to be afraid, and that's in anything. Something going on with your, your teenager right now? Transfer the weight to the Lord. Your marriage, your work, health issues, whatever it may be, transfer it. But here's the thing. Sometimes we're afraid to give it to God because we think that maybe we're being irresponsible. We're not dealing with it. You ever feel that way? This isn't like a big thing, so I should just take care of it. I should just be responsible for it. I'm not going to really give it over to, to the Lord. And sometimes I think that we miss out on the fact that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and he can do all things. 
He really all-powerful, ever-present, all-knowing God who cares for you. Do you really believe that? Because if you really deep down inside believe that that's who God is, you would be transferring that weight every single day when it comes on your door and tries to sneak up on you. See, Peter didn't get it in the boat. But then he did get it later on in life. See, in the boat, he didn't transfer. He held on to it. He was anxious. He was fearful. But later on, he cast the care. Why? Because he realized that God truly cared for him and believed in him. I want to invite the worship team back up. Storms come. You're not alone. Do you believe that? When the storms come in your life, do you really truly believe that you're not alone, that God is there for you? That would be the first question to answer. And if you don't truly believe, then it's time to seek the truth. It's time to find out. Scripture says in John 8, 8, 32 that you will come to know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so there's a, a place that we come and we trust God. Storms come, you're not alone. In the midst of the storm, you're with his presence. That's the promise. And when you're in his presence, it's for his purpose. Don't forget that when you're in his presence, it's for his purpose. God cares for the brokenhearted. He draws near to the desperate. He clothes He's close to those who are crushed in spirit. You may be rejected by people, but God will never, ever abandon you. And I'm not so sure this morning that's where we began in the midst of our worship was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. See, when you receive the outpouring of that Holy Spirit, when you the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit comes upon you, that's the assurance that you know that when you're in the midst of the storm, that God is truly with you. And he'll give you everything you need to get through the storm. Do you believe that? Or do you doubt? Because if you doubt, you're like the wave upon the sea, like that boat that gets tossed back and forth. Middle of the storm, going into the storm, coming out of the storm. Here's the promise that I know that God gives all of us. One day the storms will end. One day he overcomes all. One day we'll be in his presence if you know him as your Lord and Savior. And he'll conquer all those things. He'll restore the sick. There'll be no sick in That are depressed. He'll bring joy to those who mourn and end all rejection. He'll wipe away every tear is what the scripture says. And then we'll get to a place when we're in his presence. We'll be able to say to death, to hell with you. Because we're not even going to experience that. We're going to have everlasting presence in, in, with, with the Lord. It's going to be significant and powerful in every single The promise is, is that Jesus is going to make all things new. And until then, church, here's what we do. We gather in the boat. And the boat is what we're doing right now. Church. When Jesus comes back, he's going to raise the church. He's going to rapture the church. The church is everything to Jesus. If you ever hear anyone attack the church, stand up for the church. It's the thing that Jesus loves. It's you. This is our boat. And when you're facing the storm and you're going through it, do it with others. Do it with those that are with you and for you got your back, pray with you, believe in you, come alongside you. We saw that just recently with Kathy and the surgery she had on her foot. I mean, the outpouring of cards and, and flowers and meals and, I mean, just all the love that came in. I mean, it was just overwhelming. And I've gained 10 pounds, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not happy about that. Where are you at? We're going to worship one last time. And I, I sincerely want you to just 
set aside lunch for a moment. Set aside whatever that thing is that you're going to go do after service. Just, just set that aside. This is a big deal for me because I love golf, and the Masters is on right now, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm just saying this is a big deal for me, all right? And I've got my Jack Nicholas socks on. So, here's what I'm Can we just take a few minutes and ask this question? What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? That, that as soon as the band starts playing, that we just don't get out of here. But take something that God is saying. What storm may you be in or coming out of or... Or, or potentially going in and that you can apply the word of God this morning and you can do something so that when you leave here you have the tools to be able to I got this in Jesus Christ I got this and the power and the authority given to me through Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit I got this. anything that I can do in myself but only what God can do anything that I can accomplish but only by what God has already accomplished that you have that question is, do you believe that? So Father, I'm thankful this morning. I'm thankful for all that you're doing. I pray for an outpouring of your spirit right now, Lord God, to continue. Lord, as we just take one more moment here in the next few minutes just to worship, I pray that you would begin to do a new work, Lord God, in a new way in those that are calling upon you, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. Will you stand as we worship?